The Birdsville track runs for 517 kilometres from Birdsville in the southwestern corner of Queensland to Maree in the far northeast of South Australia. But we're starting from Adelaide, north towards our first stop in Port Augusta. It's 1,171 kilometres one way, so we'll cover many different birding habitats and feature some starkly contrasting weather conditions from previous trips. Already the rain has cleared. A quick look round the chook sheds at Port Wakefield, which are attractive to raptors. Dashing around on the ground, a familiar little bird of grasslands and farms, Australian pipit. And watching from above, a fast, agile raptor, black falcon. Continuing north, we're calling into Bowman Park, near Crystal Brook, a beautiful riverside environment with huge old river red gums offering prized nesting hollows. White-winged chuffs are always found in a family group, usually foraging on the ground or hopping around in the branches calling to each other. A much smaller ground feeder needing a close water source is the exquisitely coloured diamond firetail, a finch of southeast Australia. The lush grass is an attractive, relaxing spot for this female western grey kangaroo carrying her joey. There are inviting nesting hollows for Adelaide rosella, subspecies Flinders Adelaide rosella, and usually with paler plumage. Red-rumped parrots are small grass parrots, nearly always found in pairs. The duller colouring of the female sharply contrasts to the brilliant greens and blues of the male with his red rump. North again, past more farming land with canola crops, before turning off the main highway through Horrocks Pass to the small country town of Wilmington. Feisty enough to tackle even an eagle, Willy Wagtail has no trouble driving off this raven. It's unusual to spot a lone perched apostle bird. They're normally ground foragers in groups, though not always 12. Occurring in woodlands and partially cleared areas throughout Australia, collared sparrowhawk is a small, fierce raptor taking other birds. Very similar in appearance to brown goshawk, but with slimmer feet and a more elongated middle toe. Back through the pass onto the highway towards Port Augusta. No time this trip, but previously we've stopped on the way to explore Talawi Gorge. The river is most often dry but the habitat supports different species, such as this endangered, amazingly agile, yellow-footed rock wallaby. Yellow-faced honey eater is widespread down southeast Australia. Easily seen in its brilliant golden colouring is male western whistler. Another widespread honey eater, similar in colouring to yellow faced, is grey fronted honey eater. It's generally sedentary, with some movement in search of food in semi arid environments and is usually seen in flocks. These Adelaide rosellas are probably nesting somewhere in the River Red Gums. Leaving Port Augusta next morning, we're passing Bird Lake, now sadly birdless since water is no longer pumped from the decommissioned power station. Previously, we've seen banded stilts here, mysterious nomads which turn up in large numbers at remote ephemeral salt lakes. Today, we're heading to Maree at the start of the Birdsville track through the Pitchy Ritchie Pass. Heritage trains for tourists still run on part of the original 19th century line. 
designed for life on the wing and ploughing straight into its nest is tree marten. They're aerial foragers whose weak feet make perching difficult. The larger hollows are also attractive nesting spots for Adelaide rosella. And dead branches make ideal perch and pounce spots for laughing kookaburra, another competitor for the roomier nesting hollows, which they may keep for many years as they form permanent pair bonds and their young stay around for several years to help with rearing. Rufus Whistler is a summer migrant to southeast Australia, as is White Winged Triller, arriving in spring and departing north in autumn. The male is conspicuous by his plumage and loud trilling call. There's plenty of breeding going on. Demanding dusky wood swallow chicks are keeping their parents constantly on the hunt. Living up to its name and looking altogether more composed is Elegance Parrot, a small grass parrot with two separate areas of population in southwest and southeast Australia. We could bird all day in this busy woodland environment, but we have to keep heading north. Between Quorn and Hawker lies the Kanyaka waterhole, a permanent water source in this more arid country which has attracted white-necked heron, the spots down its neck indicating non-breeding, plus a couple of peaceful doves. Australia has three species of whiteface, of which southern whiteface is the most abundant and widespread. They're gregarious little ground feeders, but unlike the other two species, Southern whiteface choose holes in stumps, trees and posts as nest sites. Replacing dusky wood swallow on the drier plains, black-faced wood swallow shares the same effortless flight pattern. No trouble distinguishing gender in breeding fairy wrens. But it takes a closer look to do so with these busy little grey birds. Red throats take their name from the diagnostic red throat of the male, absent in the female. An instantly recognisable small parrot. And nearby, the slightly larger elegant parrot again. Dazzling rainbow bee-eaters hunt bees from a perch in agile swoops and return in a single arc to remove the sting before swallowing. Heading north towards Hawker, the country becomes drier. White-winged fairy wren starts to replace variegated in bluebush, saltbush and samphire habitat. A breeding male in full plumage is very hard to miss. And ever northwards, alongside the spectacular Flinders Ranges, it's been a long time since this country has seen any rain. The Parachulna pub provides some welcome shade as a lunch spot. But not for long, as we want to make it to the start of the track before dark. This sealed section of road is littered with roadkill attracting carrion eaters, including the largest and most majestic of Australian raptors, a young wedge-tailed eagle. We're passing Lee Creek, whose huge coal mine was closed in 2015. One pit has now been turned into an enormous retention dam, which attracts numerous water birds, including whole rafts of musk duck, breeding cormorants and migratory waders. In 2010, we drove from Adelaide through a very different and much rarer weather pattern. It just kept raining and raining, and the plains were green. The coal mine was still functioning. Now, after years of drought, maybe eagles have become more dependent on carrion. This eagle's black plumage indicates a mature bird. 
At Lindhurst is the turn-off for the Streslecki track to the Moomba gas fields and on to Inaminka. But we'll keep going north to Mari, where a rail line was built in the 1880s to transport the cattle which had been driven down the Birdsville track from Queensland. At last, we're at the start of the track. And we've made it in time to enjoy sunset over the historic Mari Hotel. We're leaving very early, relieved to see the track is open, at least to Mungarani. It was originally the main stock route from Birdsville to Mari, made possible in one of the driest parts of Australia by bores sunk into the Great Artesian Basin. This bore at Lake Harry marks a failed attempt at establishing a date palm plantation a brave agricultural venture in this inhospitable environment. The 5,400 kilometre dog fence protects sheep from dingoes and marks the start of cattle country. We're heading for Clayton Wetlands, where we camped in 2010, but by the look of the dusty road, there may not be much water around after so many years of drought. As we thought, still and quiet. In stark contrast, when we camped here in 2010, it was wet, green and teeming with life. The flashing golden green of budgie flocks, one of the great sights of the outback. Breeding wood swallows, And slithering snakes. Glad we're sleeping on top tonight. But this trip there is still water at Dulcan in a creek with an abundance of water birds which amazingly appear in these remote spots surrounded by vast desert. White-headed stilt is longer-legged and more widespread than banded stilt and is found in freshwater wetlands. Smartly plumaged red knee dotterel is highly nomadic and can turn up anywhere on ephemeral wetlands. Also occurring anywhere it can find water in inland Australia, square tip bill and stripes instantly identify pink-eared duck rather than the obscure pink patch behind the eye. Astonishing! Ostrich! the largest living bird in the world. The last feral population of another failed 19th century farming attempt inhabits this area. Surprises keep coming. Little grass bird is much commoner in the south, but can obviously disperse over great distances. Reluctantly, we're leaving the water to get back onto the dusty track. Still a long way to go. Same part of the track, but in 2010 after flooding rains. Wetlands all around with plenty for birds to feed on. Australian Pratt and Coal hawks for insects in areas of sparse vegetation but always near water. But gibber bird is the complete desert bird, living on the gibber plains of the Lake Eyre Basin, the driest, most irradiated area of Australia. It was exciting to plough on through the wet, with birds popping up everywhere in this relatively lush environment. We stopped for a break and to scan on a rise overlooking wetlands. Pigeons were flying over, quick, 
Yes, flock bronzewing. These granivorous, ground-feeding, ground-nesting pigeons were once seen in flocks of hundreds of thousands in inland Australia, but their numbers have drastically reduced and their range has retreated northward. This small flock was our first sighting of this species and considerably south of their usual range. It was a thrill to observe feeding, though not closely. They're extremely wary. The females have a mottled grey and cinnamon breast, while males have black on the face and a grey breast. Back to our latest much drier trip and a very dark morph of brown falcon and central bearded dragon on the track. We're passing the rarely used bypass for crossing Cooper Creek in flood and, high and dry, the first barge built as a ferry across the creek of which there is certainly no need now as we drive across the creek bed without even detecting a slight dip. It's a good lunch spot and never lonely with a thousand flies for company. Despite the only water source being a slight drip from the toilet tap, there is still a couple of honey eaters around. It was a very different experience when flooded and we took the 50 kilometre flood bypass to the crossing point to be ferried across. It was awe-inspiring to cross this stunningly broad expanse of water lined by green banks bursting with life and incredible to think of the huge distance this water had travelled through desert. We were amazed to see birds we usually associate with the coast, such as Caspian Tern. There were blue bonnets, parrots of semi-arid inland Australia, usually seen in pairs and hard to spot. Raptors like Nanking Kestrel followed the plentiful food sources brought by the flood. Budrigars are opportunistic breeders and the rain brought perfect conditions for them. We heard the four-note call of red-browed partalote, which is found throughout the dry eucalypt forests of northerly Australia, ranging south along tree-lined watercourses in the Lake Eyre Basin. Like all partalotes, they glean their food from eucalypt trees. North of Cooper Creek is 10 kilometres of massive loose sand dunes, the Natarani Sandhills, the bane of early settlers. Only bore water is available in 2021, attracting nomads like Australian native hen and zebra finch. Food is scarce, but adaptable widespread species like mast lapwing and little corella can still survive in this arid region. Getting close to Mungarani, we're scrutinising the communications tower, where four years ago we saw roosting grey falcon. Not this time. On the last lap now, and the conditions best suit desert birds with minimal water requirements. Mungarani Hotel and Campground stand on the edge of the Simpson, Tarari, Streslecki and Sturt Stony Deserts alongside Derwent Creek, a watercourse flowing into Warburton Creek. It's great to be arriving at last. Just time to check out the river, which is relatively dry at the moment, but still attracting birds. We can hear the loud, persistent, melodious call of breeding rufous songlark. Largest of Australian wood swallows, white-breasted wood swallow follows inland rivers to the interior. Red-backed is the kingfisher best adapted to the desert, feeding on invertebrates, small reptiles and even young birds. When we arrived here in 2010, the track to Birdsville was closed by rain. 
so plans for finding the grey grass wren were put on hold and we began searching around Mungarani for Aryan grass wren whose preferred habitat is sandhill cane grass on dunes. Grass wrens are endemic to Australia and their remote hostile environments and cryptic nature means that very little was known about these charismatic, fascinating little birds until quite recently. They're ground birds, moving quickly between bushes like mice, heads down, tails cocked. Arian is one of the smallest grass wrens, but has an exceptionally thick bill. Next day, with the road to Birdsville closed by flooding, we turned south for home, approaching the river through the Natarani Sandhills and using the ferry again. Our last new species for that trip was one of our favourites, cockatiel. In 2021, Birdsville is also off limits due to COVID border closures, but we'll try up the track to Warburton Crossing. It's delightful to cross the Miramita Creek floodway as a change from the dusty track and see more water birds. Elegant red-necked avocet is endemic to Australia and has an interesting sweeping method of feeding. And there's Pinky Duck again, a small group of brolgers is tearing up the ground with their powerful beaks in search of bulbs and edible roots, while more fly in. Standing nearly one and a half metres tall and with a 2.4 metre wingspan, brolgers are our heaviest flying birds and they look dramatically graceful in flight and tall and stately on the ground. They're widespread and abundant in north and northeast Australia with much smaller numbers in the wetlands of the southeast and even scarcer in these arid areas. The flightless emu is even taller and far commoner here and shares the same omnivorous diet. We're going as far as Warburton Crossing where there is a turnoff across the creek leading west into the Simpson Desert. Grey grass wren has been sighted here in the lignum habitat it prefers, but unfortunately has been dry for a long period. However, the lignum looks surprisingly healthy, so we're giving it a good go. Not encouraging for small birds to show though, to have a raptor circling overhead. This time it's not to be. It's back to Mungarani with the hills of the Mungarani Gap to the east. In 2017, we had been able to drive the 300 kilometres north and cross the Queensland border into Birdsville at the start of the track. We used this as a base to look for grey grass wren 90 kilometres south in the lignum habitat of Goida's Lagoon. It was 1967 before a clear view of this grass wren was obtained and subsequent work done to establish it as a new species. A small cryptic grass wren with the longest tail of the family, it inhabits dense clumps of lignum and old man salt bush. We had only the briefest glimpse, unlike this magnificent view taken by Scott McGregor and featured in the book Grass Wrens by Andrew Black and Peter Gower. On the road south, overflow bore water gave us great views of Australian Pratt and & Coal and we decided to turn west into the Gibber to explore Pandaburra Bore where the water jets out with huge force in a hot stream. Through the shimmering heat haze we were delighted to spot inland dotterel almost perfectly camouflaged when stationary on the vast gibber plains. These amazing birds live in the harshest of environments without needing water, other than the water they obtain from the leaves of the chenopods on which they feed, excreting this salt intake through large salt glands in their nostrils.
Somewhat reluctantly in the intense heat, we climbed a promising sand dune for a closer look at Aryan grass wren. In 2021, we spent our last day based at Mungarani, heading out to nearby Kauri Station where there had been a little rainfall. Like inland dotterel, orange chat can withstand very arid conditions and extreme heat while feeding mainly on chenopods, the male is particularly dazzling. This communications tower does contain a nest, that of one of Australia's rarest raptors, grey falcon. Trees of this height are almost as rare as this raptor around the dry interior. They snatch smaller prey from the ground and take birds in the air, which makes it surprising to find this banded white-faced nest in such close proximity. But dense, flourishing bushes of this height are not plentiful in this arid zone, and unlike southern whiteface, they need to find a suitable bush in which to build a nest on the stark, inhospitable gibber plains and sandy ridges of the interior. They forage on the ground in short hops, usually in small feeding parties, and rely on the seeds, spiders and insects they feed on to provide their water. There are plentiful locusts at the moment for this busy breeding pair. Saltbush, Bluebush and Gibber Plain is also home to cinnamon quail thrush, smallest of the quail thrush and almost entirely a ground bird. This male is giving great views as we head back to Mungarani. Early morning reveals white-breasted wood swallow in a typical cosy row, rainbow bee-eater and diamond dove. We're early enough to catch a pair of blue bonnets feeding on the ground. They feed only morning and evening, roosting quietly and inconspicuously in trees during the heat of the day and blending in with their brown plumage. The male has the bluer face. Reluctantly, we have to turn south and head for Mari. But almost immediately, we encounter another group of Brolga crossing the road to find water. They're famous for their dancing displays during breeding, but they also leap and flap about spontaneously, and they're great fun to observe. Now we've hit an immense expanse of gibber plain, which gives us a further chance to observe feeding gibber bird, the gibber specialist, if we can avoid heat stroke. This frozen shot shows its white iris. Raptors like this brown falcon make use of the scarce vantage points. It's more usual to see dingoes as dusk approaches, especially in this extreme heat and aridity, but it's a lean, hardy native dog, well adapted to very harsh conditions. Where there is water in this environment, there are always zebra finches. And often galahs, Australia's commonest and most widespread cockatoo. We're heading back through Sturt stony desert to Maree at the end of the same track which rains had burst into life in 2010.